I'm going to give a couple examples right now of, of some of those things that I think are different about big data solutions that you didn't see with traditional uh, business intelligence solutions. The first one is the Climate Corporation. The Climate Corporation was started by uh, a couple of folks out of Google. Um, they, in telling the story that they had told uh, during their presentation, they said, we were watching uh, a bicycle uh, outside the, of the offices where they work. There was a stand for renting bicycles. And then one of their folks noted, when it rains, that gentleman doesn't rent any bicycles. And so this small business is impacted by bad weather. And the recognition came to them. They said, well, a lot of small businesses are impacted by weather. And whereas large businesses can adopt hedging strategies and take out forms of insurance that prevent them from being excessively impacted by it, smaller businesses tend not to have those safety nets. And so they said, what, what is preventing us from providing some form of insurance to, to these smaller businesses? Why, ca why can't we give them some product that they can use and is, is both financially viable for them, but also a viable business for us? And, and the thing is, is what it really took was the ability to analyze weather patterns at a significantly granular level to be able to go to a farmer, for example, and say, hey, uh, you've got uh, this plot of land. I can tell you that it's experiencing this amount of rainfall. And based on market conditions right now, I can, I can quote you a policy for the rest of the, uh, for the, rest of the season. And so they, they actually, it was interesting because they went through a number of models before they actually settled on farming and in particular cash crops. They'd been going at this for a few years, but it was only in last year that they settled into this, this persona of the Climate Corporation focused on, right now, small farmers in America. If you go to the site, it's kind of neat. What you'll see here, and you can drill down on, is a Google's map, Google map implementation. It shows the weather grids, and I think it's about five square miles. And you can click on it, and so you go and enter in your address, and you can see what the precipitation history has been for the past 10 days, and heat index has been for the past days for your particular locale. I can't say that I know that it's implemented here. I do know that it works in my own county. Not that I'm growing anything. But this is an example of, of taking a level of granularity, of providing a level of granularity that we couldn't do before, that our technology didn't allow us to do. So this is one of the things that excites me about, um, about big data solutions. The next. The next uh, example I'd like to talk about are our recommendation engine. And I think this is interesting because in both cases, Amazon.com and Netflix, recommendations are extremely important to their businesses. So with Amazon, the, the quoted figures are roughly 35% of their sales are generated from recommendations. Um, yeah, that sounds great. It sounds, it sounds like a really good number. Why is that important? Well, Amazon actually experiences roughly three times the conversion rate of, other, of, of the best retailers behind it. It's sort of Amazon, a group of retailers who are somewhere in the 3%, and then the ones who are barely making it are somewhere in the 2 to 1% or below. And that's that conversion rate of people coming to your site to turning into actual buyers. And, and I think you can all see why that's a really important number to online retailers. Because if you're going out and you've got uh, venture capitalists behind you saying, hey, um, you, know, you need more money, What's the potential for this, for this company? That conversion factor is telling you how much you can sell. Because there are so, only so many people on the planet. And if you are not hitting a, a significant uh, percentage of those, you're never going to cross a certain threshold in revenues. Again, Amazon is, is, one of, is sort of the benchmark. And they attribute a, a significant portion of that to their success with their recommendation engines. And of course, you can argue that to say, well, actually, you know, Amazon, I'm going there with some specific intent. I know they have great prices. I think those are valid arguments. But, but there's definitely something to be said for the fact that you're going to go to their site, and they're going to tell you something that you didn't originally, you might not have originally thought to buy. Netflix, um, and I had seen the presentation from the CTO when I talked to him afterwards. 75%, and that was a higher number than I had seen reported before, 75% of selections are from recommendations. Well, they don't sell per item. Why is that important to them? You get in a Netflix subscription. You go online. The movie you want to see isn't there. That happens another time and another time. 
at the end of the month, you get the next bill for the next month. Do you pay it? No, you let it lapse because you didn't find anything you were interested in. So the ability to constantly put content in front of you and get your interest is critical to them to keep their subscription level. And both of those are driven by these recommendation engines, which are fascinating devices. I think the, 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 the science that goes, the, the combination of sciences that go into uh, recommendation engines represent many aspects of big data. First, there's that, that, that predictive modeling and the affinity grouping that occurs. You create your, your initial set and the relationships between your products. And then there's that interaction, that constant interaction. Um, that you experience on the site as people are making selections and browsing and, and uh, you know, pausing on, on particular items or starting to make selections and work through different recommendations and that learning that is applied. So through the concept of, again, stuff we couldn't do before, but also that other point that I brought up about starting to work with data directly, having it drive how we interact with our, our clients, our customers. Okay. So the last example I'm going to give is the Target story. And I'm, <coughs> excuse me, I've, I've been talking to a bunch of people, and I've been tickled pink that this is a new story here, in, at least to the folks I've talked to so far. How many people are familiar with this whole, the Target story? You can't raise your hand. OK, still, there's, it's not a done story, because in the US, we got a lot of press about it. So. Um, it, it, it's done. In fact, I, I bumped into a data scientist from Target, and I said, look, I'm really sorry. I just have to ask you. And you could just see the look of horror in his face. He knew I was going to ask about this, this story. So for those of you who don't know it, um, Target is, has a fantastic data warehousing practice. Um, they're, they're really a role model for it, and they have a massive warehouse that's uh, dr driven by uh, some really interesting technology, um, mostly traditional, honestly. Um, and they have uh, their crew of data scientists who try and look for correlations between buying behaviors and, 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 uh, and particular products or, or uh, particular you know, outside factors. And, uh, and one of the business folks uh, approached the, the data science team and said, hey, you know what? For us, new parents are a gold mine market. They're going to be buying bassinets. They're going to be buying diapers. They're going to be buying all sorts of stuff. So if we could get out in front of new parents, that would be fantastic for us. So what can you do to figure out if somebody might be pregnant? Well, they went off, and they started doing some of this analysis. And what they were able to determine was that there was a relationship between, a strong relationship, between the, a, a woman starting to purchase certain items, lotions, uh, unscented lotions, uh, multivitamins, and just this, this array of products. And they could start correlating the, um, the, the possibility, the potential for pregnancy against those. And of course, now to track that, they need a lot of test data. They need a lot of information. That goes into how much do you capture from, from loyalty programs, how much do you capture from online, uh, from your cookies online and people logging in, what kind of information do you have about people? And, and there's a lot to that. But they were able to not only, this is the thing that turns it from data science to just plain creepy, is they can talk about estimating due dates within a small window. So what they started to do, again, how do you interact with the data? Well, they took it and they started pushing it into circulars. Now, they were smart enough not to say, congratulations on your new baby, because that might be awkward if someone hasn't told anyone else. Um, but they weren't smart enough, because what happened was they sent one of these circulars out to a 16-year-old girl that was littered with new, new, you know, new expecting mom products. And uh, the father of the 16-year-old girl came to the store and was livid and raised a ruckus. And, and of course, uh, uh, Target jumped right on it. And they, they contacted the person and said, we're really sorry. This is terrible that happened. It's our mistake. And he had to say, no, it wasn't your mistake. You were right. My daughter is pregnant. And so they were able to actually predict and determine this pregnancy before the family could. And that's, again, I use the word creepy a lot when I describe this. It is a little scary how much you can start to determine from people if you have enough information. And you think about, you log on to Facebook or you log on to another site, an Instagram or, or some, you go to you know, various sites and you say, oh, do you want to log in through Facebook? 
because now you're, you're building those threads. You're building, you're leaving those breadcrumbs. I was fascinated to, to hear from, from a woman who's a preeminent uh, data scientist that um, the trail can actually last, in, in many cases, uh, on, on cookies, can actually last on an average of 60 days. That people aren't clearing things out, they're, they're letting the history retain and generating all sorts of traffic and information for themselves. And especially if you've linked up and you've sort of opened yourself up to describe the different sites you're going to, the different things you're, uh, you're uh, looking at and purchasing, th that's a lot of information about your habits. So um, I've talked about all the reasons to be excited about data warehousing and why should we, sh or, or, I'm sorry, about big data and why we should be jumping on the bandwagon and how it's different and, and new. Um, now I'm going to turn into my, you know, I went from being a technologist who's optimistic and excited to my project manager persona who is dour and pessimistic and always looking for things to fail. This is the Gartner hype cycle, and I, I think it's a great representation of these phenomena that we experience. And again, for those of us who've been in this industry for a while, we've seen this sort of pattern occur First with the web itself, and I could go back even further than that, but let's say with the web, we're seeing a little bit of it with mobile perhaps, seeing it with the cloud. I think people are all tired of hearing something's on the cloud right now. What does this, what, what, what does this mean? What does this describe to us? Well, um, I, and I love the labels. These are all Gartner's labels. I love the peak of inflated expectations and the trough of disillusionment and then to your slope of enlightenment. That's, that's the best. Um, but what happens is you have some sort of trigger, you have some sort of event where people recognize, hey, there's something here, there's something we should be interested in. And the publishing of that paper, the, the, the performance of companies like Amazon, Facebook, uh, Yahoo even, um, and of course Google, and saying, wow, they're doing some incredible things, amazing things. How are they accomplishing that? Well, we're using these technologies, and so some momentum starts going, and you see people jumping on the bandwagon. You see uh, startups starting to emerge that are leveraging or creating and leveraging different types of, of big data. And so people get more and more excited about it. Um, in October, there's the O'Reilly Strata Conference coming to London. I don't know if it's the first time it's been to London. I think it is. If you are interested in this stuff, that's a great conference to go to. But the thing I'll say is when you go there, it's all these people who are really on the cutting edge or bleeding edge of, of uh, this science. And, um, and there's a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of excitement. And I have to say, I'm sitting there saying, gosh, I remember back in 1999 moderating a uh, information week session on e-business. And I saw all the same enthusiasm and excitement. And the next year, I wasn't invited back, and it wasn't because of my performance. Um, I hope. Um, so, so, you know, you get that enthusiasm, you start the roller coaster ride up, and what happens that you should hit the peak? Well, it starts to get out in the mainstream. Corporate users, start, uh, corporations, organizations are starting to hear more and more about this exciting new technology and say, I got to get me some of that. And when that happens, the product companies are jumping on it, and they're getting into the game. And so now there's all this excitement and hype, and then we start to, start to have these crazy promises. And eventually, of course, we don't meet those promises. Uh, the, the, the experiences that people have are different from what they had hoped. And so, of course, it's got to be the technology's fault. It can't be anything we did. So that you go into that trough of disillusionment. Eventually, you figure out, well, maybe it was a little bit my fault, and you start using the technology as it was meant to be used, and you start to learn, hey, it's, it's not going to cure a world hunger, but at the same time, it's a good tool, and it's just part of my arsenal. And what I'd like to talk about now is what I think some of the things that will cause that peak of inflated expectations and that trip down to the trough of disillusionment. Three things. First, the bright and shiny object. Um, so as soon as you start seeing this excitement occur, you know, people start talking about what they're doing. You start seeing articles. McKinsey is, is in their quarterly briefing is publishing about big data. Gartner has their section talking about the, you know, it, it within the business intelligence community and talking about actually having their own big data community and talking about all the exciting things that are happening. So CIOs, CTOs, are getting bombarded with this information. And they're, they're seeing these reports, and they're like, wow, there's something out there 
that I might be able to deliver some value to my business. There's something that people are getting on. And of course, now they're also, their vendors who have said, hey, our product's ready for big data. They've gotten on them too and said, hey, we can solve this problem for you. There's an easy way to solve it. So, okay, great, I get excited by it. At the same time, your, your uh, business community is starting to see this. They're hearing reports of, of you know, all these great experiences, of the target experience. If you're in, the, in that market, you know, it's, it's less creepy and more attractive. It's something that you want to achieve. You want to have that knowledge about your customer. Um, so so these, these leaders on the business and the technology side are being sold on this thing. And they say, yeah, yeah, we want that. We want to have that. Do they really know what that is? Have they really defined the business value they're going to get from it? Or are they just you know, suffering from the bombardment from all the sides, all the hype that they're facing? And we've seen this in the past. We've seen people, uh, and, and I, I don't fault those individuals. They, again, I use the term bombarded intentionally. You're in a leadership position and you're getting pressured to deliver results and to explore new technologies um, and, and, and show value in your organization. And so you, uh, you make these investments, you start to pursue some of these things, but you don't really know what you're getting into sometimes. And that's, that's a big cause of these overexploited, overinflated expectations, unfortunately not being met. The second one is the challenges of working in a cutting edge space. So the thing that actually excites us about this new world is the fact that it's sh shaken up what had been a fairly stagnant market. If you go back, um, data warehousing and business intelligence really came, started to get uh, interesting in the early 90s. And you were seeing a lot of small companies come out supporting uh, you know, different OLAP engines or supporting um, ETL processes or, or metadata management or, or your reporting and analysis needs. So you had a whole host of new players and a lot of innovation. And, and that market had consolidated over the years. So you have a bunch of big players and focused on the big market and, and not moving quite as quickly. Well, that's changed. And now we have a whole array of these new open source technologies that people are excited about. But they are new. So if you look at this, this is, and I just picked these four randomly. You could pick other uh, of the, you know, the new big data uh, type technologies. But Hadoop, Cassandra, React, and MongoDB. MongoDB is in release two, so in some ways you could say they're the more, most mature of the product, but of course the year that they were first released into production is listed too. And so all of these products are you know, five years or less. Um, and they're also supported by, these are the organizations that have that relationship, that enterprise, the community and enterprise relationship. They're the, the groups that are making the money off the product and support, by supporting it in, in commercial implementations. And, then, and, and again, I don't mean, to, to, uh, I don't mean to, to pick on any of these vendors. There's some really bright, talented people. I think some great people in these groups. The reality is, though, you're working on the cutting edge. You're using code that these guys are releasing possibly every day. You're going out and pulling down the latest release candidate because you got a bug that you just discovered and you need to solve it. That's OK if you're in an organization like a Facebook or a, or Twitter or some other uh, startup that is focused on technology and has really bright, talented engineers who are passionate about what they're doing and excited to the opportunity to work on these new technologies and willing to pay the penalty associated with it. And that might mean a late night or a weekend trying to figure out why doesn't this work? And, and again, I think that especially, uh, you know, props to, to the folks at Mongo for uh, recent reactions and a release of, uh, of 2.05 and, and solve some, some major problems. They're very reactive to this stuff. You just, you've decided to play in a different playground. And for bus business decision, uh, for many uh, dis decision makers, that's a scary space to operate in. Because maybe I'm in a business where technology is not something I consider a core strategic asset, that it's not making money for me. It's actually a cost. It tracks, uh, it tracks my performance and it, it makes sure that uh, I get my checks out on time, but I don't see it as something that's actually changing my business. And for that reason, I've made technology solutions that are safe and easy to use so I can make sure I can, you know, I can hire people easiest rather than I have to go out and woo the best and the brightest. So when you start to mix this lack of maturity with those types of mindsets, 
you're going to have risk. You're going you're to send some people to Hadoop training, and hopefully they come back and they're ready to, to roll, and they know something about Hadoop now, and they're more, they're more capable to take it on. Are they the people who are going to spend the weekend trying to figure out the problem, or potentially you know, looking to be a committer to the project? That's something that you have to think about before you make that decision. And then, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, and the last one I had pointed out there was, um, what about the value? What are we getting from this? And this is, a, this is an article I pulled down because it, it brought to the link on Dave Carroll. And if you're not familiar with Dave Carroll, he was a, uh, a, a brief internet phenomena. What happened was uh, he is a musician. Uh, his guitar was broken uh, by United on a flight. He called up uh, customer service and said, hey, you know what? Uh, there's limitations, tough luck, sorry. So what he did is he made a little song about it and posted it on YouTube and got 9 million hits. At which point United said, hey, by the way, we'll replace that guitar for you. Don't worry about it. And he said, you know, actually, I'm doing much better with the videos. Thank you. Um, but what that did was that initiated a response within the industry, within the airline industry. And this is an article from uh, 2010, I think, uh, talking about how all of these industries had, or all of these airlines had jumped on this and said, okay, we've got to monitor Twitter. If somebody comes on and says, Delta sucks, we want to know about it. We want to understand what's happening. We want to make sure that things don't go viral again and it doesn't impact our reputation. Um, and that's great, and I think it's, a, it, it's a, an interesting use of the technology and it might be really beneficial. But I've also done some research trying to find quantitative results experienced by making this investment. And so far, I haven't seen any. I mean, maybe I've missed it, but, but I've been looking for this because uh, th 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 this is the question. Yeah, this is cool. Now I know when people are saying bad things about me, but is this really driving more activity for my business? Are people really making their decisions based on this? Sure, a couple people might drop off, but the reality is, I mean, for me, ThoughtWorks in the U.S. uses United as a preferred carrier. I'm getting on a United flight, no matter how much I like the video or feel, feel his frustration, because that's kind of who they picked for me. So these sorts of decisions might be, you know, or these sorts of impact that we expect may not occur. And that's what I want people to think about is, what's the benefit that I'm going to get from this? And how do I measure that? So that if I go out there and I convince my CTO to spend a few million pounds on getting this initiative off the ground. At the end, besides having a really interesting article in the New York Times, what did we get for it? Okay, so I've talked about the things that, that, that scare me about it and I've talked about the things that excite me. So I, I might seem like I'm waffling. What do, what do I really think? What are, what's my attitude on this? And it is that simply, I don't buy data is the new oil. I don't like that metaphor. But I do like this one. Data is a corporate asset. You paid for that data. You pay for its upkeep. You pay for its upkeep because you, you maintain that storage. You maintain those people who maintain that storage. You pay for the electricity. So you're constantly, I, I talked to a client today who, who literally told us, um, we've got a billion records. I was like, wow, do you need to keep that for a particular reason? It's like, no, we just had a system that, that saved a billion records. It just kept saving the information. It's like, can you do something with that? And so we think we can, but we haven't tried yet. That's an asset that hasn't been capitalized, that you haven't valued or de de derive a value from. And some organizations are out there. Back in 85, um, and it's nice to be in a room where when I say back in 85 and people don't look at me, you're like, I'm crazy. Um, you know, um, Michael Porter wrote about it and started talking about information technology changing the way businesses operate and starting to think about you know, how this drives your products and how it impacts you. And seeing later down the line, um, McDonald at, um, at P&G has driven his organization that way. He said the, the, the story about P&G is they have this big command center, um, and uh, I think it's a weekly meeting, and all the executives get together, and there's one chair left open for the analyst. And this room is kind of like a Jedi council chamber. It's got oh, screens all around it and they're projecting all the information. They can throw, it up, throw up anything at any particular time and start to drill down into the numbers. And the analyst sits there and explains what's going on. And it's a very data-driven culture. And it's really done the business quite well. So, so see, even the, the business leads are recognizing 
data is an important aspect of the business. It can, it can make me more successful. It can find new opportunities for me if I'm leveraging it properly. And I think big data is definitely that, it can be that asset for your organization if you explore it effectively. And so that's what we're going to talk about now. And I'm going to finish up my discussion about some of the things you mistakes you can make and ways you can avoid them. Build it and they will come. This sticks in my craw. Now, because the first time I heard it was, I think, even back in 93, when I started to hear data warehousing vendors get on this kick. It's from the movie Field of Dreams, which came out in the late 80s, I think. And, and they, they, they hopped on this line, well, if you build it, your, your business people will come to you. Meaning, you create this huge data repository, all the knowledge of your organization, compile it together, make them this, this huge fountain of knowledge that all of your business users can drink with, and you will be showered with adulation and praise. I don't think they used quite the biblical terms, but they were, they were pretty passionate about it, and I hated that. It's a data-driven approach. It's saying, go out there and, and get the, the, all the data and pull it together and then see what questions you can answer. Now, the problem with that is I use the, model, the term data is an asset. Not every asset has the same value. Some assets, some of your data assets, are extremely high value, and some are relatively low. And some of them are easy to capitalize, and some are really hard because of data quality issues or crazy business rules. And the point about it is, is if you're taking a data-driven approach, I say, I'm going to fix all of this data first, then I'm going to come to you. And what would happen is people would build these data warehouses, and they would take literally years to complete, and they come back, and the questions changed. It didn't meet the needs of the business. So taking that data-driven approach is something that, that I hope people will avoid, but I have started to hear build it and will it will come. Again, I heard it in a presentation and, and it curdled my stomach. Boiling the ocean. Similar to build it and they will come, it's, it's more about I have to solve all of the problems. I have to polish this thing to the nth degree before I present it to the users. I have to make sure that if you were looking for a, a, a set of reports, I'm going to have all of those reports completed. So I am not taking a data-driven approach. I might ask you. I might go up and say, okay, uh, I'll put together five or ten prototypes for you and take a look at them. And what do you think? Oh, I love them. Great. I'm going to go implement them all and I'll come back to you. Again, driving towards that long-running project, not delivering value for weeks, months, or even years. And every time you have that kind of lag, you've left your business without a solution. There, and, and what do businesses, what, what do business users do when they can't get the information from their IT department? Well, they go to that evil tool, the spreadsheet, and and so they they get it out of they get it out of some source system somewhere. They copy it and paste it from somewhere. They do something that pulls that information out of source systems, and then they start manipulating it. And then it becomes a source of truth. And then the spreadsheet that Ruth builds off the Bob's spreadsheet becomes a source of truth. And suddenly your organization has 20 sources of truth on how much revenue they made last month. That's not an exaggeration. That is an example uh, from a client um, problem we were trying to solve last year for them. So OK, so this is what you shouldn't do. What should you do? Start simple. Don't dive right into the large, risky, expensive parts of the initiatives. I love the example that Stuart gave before. You know, talking about being able to slap the, the credit card down and pay for it, it was, uh, it was something in the order of 10 pounds, he said? A yeah. So, so we're, talking about, we're not talking about a million dollars in product licensing. We're talking about small investments. And it may not be on the, uh, on the Google platform, but take a problem that your business is trying to answer. Take a, take a question that they have and that they can't answer and answer it for them quickly and easily and see if it makes sense. And if it does, then start to continue to invest and build incrementally. So, uh, you know, and I, I really like this, and I'll talk a little bit about OODA loops in a second. Um, it, it, I, I feel like the, the, one of the exciting aspects to, to providing intelligence to the business is you, you go through the scientific method. There's a hypothesis out there. Say, okay, well, let's see if we can prove it. Let's see if it's true. And sometimes you're proven wrong. And say, like, ah, I, I experienced a result in my test that I didn't expect. What did I learn from that? And that starts the next set of questions. And so you start building on questions after questions, and you learn more about your business. 
and think iteratively. It's that process of looping around, constantly revisiting the problem and, and building on your success, building on your learnings. Um, and, I, and I'm gonna give some selected reading or suggested readings afterwards. And one of the things, one of the principles I think that applies very uh, well here is uh, the lean startup, the principles in the book Lean Startup by Eric Ries. Um, Eric talks about a minimal viable product set. What's the simplest thing that you can deliver to the market to get feedback from your users, to understand whether what you're doing is right or wrong and is viable? And I think that's extremely applicable to what you're doing here. And uh, th this is the OODA loops, and I'm seeing more and more of the, or, or seeing a number, I shouldn't say more and more, a number of uh, data scientists employ this methodology, which is interesting too, because as we're getting more agile and more iterative, seeing people in the data science and the, the analytics group starting to apply the same principles as well. And instead of going off and building the ultimate model that represents uh, a behavior to, the, uh, to a high degree, a 78 or 89% um, accuracy, they're saying, you know what? Let's get a simple model out there that, that's a little better than a coin toss. See how that works. Get, leverage that, see if it's applicable, and learn from it. So we're not waiting six months or nine months to get a model out when we've already missed the retail season. So uh, the OODA loop, um, the si simple and kind of stupid name, but it actually comes from, I believe, um, uh, military aviators use this. They observe, orient, decide, and act. It's like, what's going on? Understand the context, what the situation I'm in, make a decision based on that understanding, act, and see what happens. So um, I'm going to finish up, really. The last things I want people to think about, the things I want you to all take away from this, and I think hopefully find valuable, is it's still an evolving discipline. You, the folks who have raised your hands, in a sense, you're, you're a little bit of pioneers, and, and you probably have some of the pain and suffering that pioneers experience. Um, so if you're gonna dip your toe in the water, I, I don't say avoid risk. Avoiding risk is a bad strategy. A good strategy is understanding your risk, quantifying it, and then taking, taking the appropriate risk. So understand there's a risk stepping into it, but sometimes it's a, real, a risk worth taking. Um, right now, there is no big data in a box. Uh, and I don't mean to bash some of the uh, uh, big vendors when I say this, because they're starting to say I have uh, a big data in the box. They have solutions that fit for particular needs. The thing that we're seeing right now is the solutions that are coming out of this big data initiative are, are varied and sometimes very unique to the business. So until we start getting this, obviously we're starting to see commercial recommendation engines and other tools like that. But until we get to a point where this is a, a, all solved and defined problems, you're just not gonna just buy a solution. You're gonna need talented people who can craft this solution. And the last one, and I haven't talked about this at all, but leveraging the benefits of this big data will require business agility. And what do I mean by that? Well, I mentioned before one of the things I think is exciting is when you learn something you didn't know and didn't expect. You learn that you were wrong. Um, data scientists do this quite a bit. You know, they use mathematical mo models to describe events and they, they find out relationships. And sometimes they find out well, patterns of behavior that the business thought was true, and they're like these are the solid rules of our industry, are not necessarily the case that what was driving behaviors might be different. Hey, you know what? I know you've done all these promotions and all of these exciting things to drive people in your store, but the truth is people show up in your store when it rains. So if you can figure out how to make it rain, you've got something going there, but until then, what you're doing isn't working. And so are you ready to say, well, gosh, I better start working on the weather machine or figure out some other way to drive people into the store? Or are you gonna sit back and say, no, 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 I know this is, this is tried and true practices. Your business has to adapt to the knowledge. If you're trying to uh, uh, operate a data-driven organization, you have to be ready to respond to that, that data. You have to be able to make decisions that might break old precepts. So, so if you're really gonna benefit from it, it's gonna have to drive beyond your technology group. Okay. So as I said, some suggested reading. Um, a book that I, you know, I had been told it, it is out. It's, 
If you go to Amazon, it's still in pre-order. I know there are some versions of it out that you can get off of Savari and you can get off of a pre-read off of Martin's site. But Martin Fowler and uh, Pramod Sadelgay, two uh, thought, well, everybody knows Martin, uh, Pramod is a uh, senior architect and he's speaking over in Hamburg shortly on NoSQL. They, they uh, paired on this book uh, and it's NoSQL distilled. I, I recommend it. I, I did the pre-read on it and uh, Martin in particular, Pramod is a great writer too, but does a great job of just making concepts very simple and clean. And so, I, you know, his description of the NoSQL community, I think is a great one to introduce you to it and to get a good, solid understanding. Second book is uh, by a colleague of mine, and actually, um, I, while I manage the practice, Ken is the practice lead, so he's the real brains behind the organization. And um, he wrote a book, Agile Analytics, a business-driven, uh, value-driven approach to business intelligence and data warehousing. And uh, it's primarily the application of agile practices to data warehousing type projects. But I think it's useful as you're getting into big data that you can use these engineering practices and that they, they do make sense in this discipline. And the last one is, of course, uh, Eric Reese's book, The Lean Startup. That's it, thank you for listening.